Dear students, in this video, now we are going to discuss the Mosebel spectroscopy. Mosebel spectroscopy is a versatile technique used to study the nuclear structures. Here we use the absorption and then re emission of gamma rays. As you know that the gamma rays are also the part of electromagnetic spectrum. So here in this technique, we use the combination of the Doppler shift and the Mosebel effect study the hyperfine transition between the excited and ground state of the nucleus. So the most commonly studied isotopes are the isotopes of the iron, 57 and tin. The topic today here we are going to discuss are principle of Mosebel spectroscopy, principle of Mosebel spectroscopy. Okay, spectroscopy. And secondly, second thing which we will discuss are about the recoil energy. That what is the recoil energy which is used in the Mosebel spectroscopy? And other thing which we will discuss is the Mosebel effect. And then we will here, we will discuss Doppler effect and the topic of here, we will discuss isomer shift. Okay, so we will try to cover all these important phenomena which are related with the Mosebel spectroscopy. So first we will discuss about the principle of Mosebel spectroscopy. So what is the principle? Here the principle of Mosebel spectroscopy means that what is the working principle uh, of this technique on which according to which this technique works. So uh, here we need the two important things. First, one thing is the source and another thing is the sample. Okay, here source is the source of gamma rays and samples means the uh, complex which we want to study. So, uh, here source, uh, source, as the source we always use as the radioactive source. As you know that the radioactive nucleus, let's suppose that access any radioactive nucleus. So it is the radioactive nucleus and it has atomic number C and this mass number is A. So whenever it captures an electron, so it, it captures the electron, then it will convert itself into another excited nucleus. So here atomic number reduced by D minus 1 and this mass number is always A. So here, now for the uh, Mosebel spectroscopy, we commonly used source, source of cobalt. We use the cobalt 57 as our radioactive element. So C number is 27. So when cobalt captures an electron, so when it captures the electron, then it converts itself into the iron 26 to 57, mass 57. So this iron is in the excited state. It is in the excited state. So it cannot stay here for a long time. This iron 57 nucleus cannot stay for a long time in the excited state. So here we can say that Let's suppose this is the iron 57 and this one is the ground state and this one is this cited state. So iron 57 cannot stay for a long time to the excited state. So there will be the transition from excited state to the ground state. There is the emission of gamma rays. Okay. So there is the gamma rays emission. So during this the excitation from excited state to the ground state it emits the gamma rays and these gamma rays found 
another iron nucleus and let's for this is a ground state and this one is a side state so when this iron nucleus it absorbs it will absorb this gamma rays and it will go from ground state to the excited so here this process in which the nucleus iron nucleus excited iron nucleus emits the gamma rays so this is process is called as gamma rays fluorescence this is gamma rays fluorescence and in the process when these gamma emitted gamma rays find another carbon nucleus and this carbon it excites the carbon nucleus this carbon nucleus will absorb these gamma rays and it will go from ground state to the excited state so this process this absorption of gamma rays is known as gamma rays resonance it's known as gamma rays resonance so this gamma rays happen to the nucleus it happen always happens to the nucleus which is called as the sample so this is the sample nucleus for which we want to get the information okay this is our sample for which we want to get our information and this one is the source so here we need the two things one is the source of the gamma rays and other one is the sample nucleus for which we want to get information so here are the two things which we need to discuss which we need to understand here so the first thing is uh, let's suppose this is the gamma rays fluorescence and this one is the excited state and this one is the ground state so here when gamma rays for this source release the energy it releases the gamma rays of when it de excites from excited state it comes from excited state to the ground state it releases the gamma rays and these gamma rays emits an energy of 14.4 keV so during the transition from excited state to the ground state okay uh, so the other nucleus the other nucleus which is called as the sample this one is its ground state and this one is the excited state of the sample nucleus this one is the sample and this one is the source okay and source nucleus need the energy of 14.4 keV to go from excited state ground state make the transition from the ground state the excited state so but it doesn't happen these gamma rays when absorbed by the this a uh, sample nucleus this sample nucleus doesn't move to the excited state because although the energy release during this gamma ray emission is always is equal to the 14.4 keV but some of its energy when it reach at the sample is some of its energy is used uh, during the recoil and so the signal reach at the simple samples are not so powerful inside the sample so whenever it release the gamma rays some of its energy is used in the recoil okay so this energy is always less than 14.4 keV so it cannot excite the sample so here the sum of energy is lost it means that some energy is lost during the recoil process so uh, what is here we need to study we need to understand the term recoil energy okay so what is recoil recoil energy how the energy of these gamma rays is lost in the process of recoil so here the recoil is to it is to conserve the angular momentum to conserve the angular momentum okay now uh, we will go to the detail of the 
recoil energy. What is the energy? So recoil energy. So uh, to recoil energy, let's suppose here again, I will draw the excited and the ground state of sample and source. So this is the ground state and this one is the excited state of the uh, source. Source nuclei. So the source nuclei, when D excite, it emits the gamma rays. Okay, it will emit the gamma rays, and here is the sample nuclei. So here is the sample. So sample nuclei absorb these gamma rays, and it go from excite ground state to the excited state by the absorption of gamma rays. So here is the Gamma rays, this process is the gamma rays fluorescence. And this is the gamma rays resonance. Okay, so here the, the energy released by the source. Energy released, gamma rays released by the source, these strike at this sample. These strike at the sample and it can be used in two ways. First, the gamma rays energy is used to excite the nucleus. Excite the nucleus. And secondly, it's used to overcome the recoil energy. Overcome the recoil. Okay, recoil of nucleus. So we can say that total energies of emitted gamma rays is the sum of gamma, recoil energy Er plus energy used to excite the nucleus. So when gamma rays resonance occur here at the sample, when gamma rays resonance occur, so the sum part of uh, so, uh, at the same time some part of the nucleus move backward okay it move backward so, uh, the, for the backward motion the energy required for this motion is during the resonance this energy is called as recoil energy it's recoil energy and just like when we fire from the gun when we fire, then there is the backward motion of the gun, just uh, that is due to the to conserve the angular momentum. So the recoil energy is the same thing. Okay, whenever there is a resonance occur, some part of the nucleus move backward to conserve the angular momentum. So the some part of energy is used for this backward motion. So to overcome this energy loss due to recoil, we use the gamma rays of slightly higher frequency, of slightly higher energy to overcome this recoil energy. So here the gamma rays of slightly higher energies are always used because the some part of energy, in a, this gamma rays energy is used in two ways. So some part is used excite the nucleus and some part of this gamma ray is used to overcome the recoil energy. Here the recoil energy can be written as Er is equal to E square divided by 2m square. Here E is the energy, it is the energy between excited and ground state and ground state and C is the velocity of light and M is the mass of the nucleus this M is M is the is the mass of nucleus okay and so it means that this equation tells us that whenever, if 
mass increases. If ma mass increases, then recoil energy decreases because there is the inverse relation between the nuclear mass and recoil energy. So uh, this is the drawback here that uh, how uh, th there is a problem and we need to solve this problem that how we can reduce the energy loss due to this recoil energy. So here the scientist whose name was uh, name was R. L. R. L. Mosiber, uh, Rudolf L. Mosiber, and who he resolved this problem, and so it is known as the Mosiber effect. So here now we will discuss how Mosiber solved this problem of recoil energy. So now we will go to the Mosiber effect. So, what is Mosiber effect? Mosiber effect. So, Mosiber gives an, an idea that how we can reduce or minimize the recoil energy. Recoil energy. So, what was his idea? His idea was that, like again, uh, I can draw that this is the uh, this is source, and this one is site uh, ground state, and this one is excited state. This one is the sample, and again, this is the excited the ground state, and this one is the excited state. So, there is the transition from excited state to ground state, and there is a transition. From ground state to excited state. Okay, so these are the gamma. So here we can reduce the loss due to the recoil energy if we found the nucleus, if we tied the nucleus in the solid form. Okay, by or we can reduce by keeping the nucleus by keeping. The nucleus are our sample in solid form or in the crystalline form but by keeping it in the crystalline form so when we have the crystalline solids we know that atoms are uh, very close together then there are a the lot of forces which bind the different atoms and nucleus together in the form of solids so in solid we have active mass solids have effective mass so effective mass of the nucleus you know that effective mass is very much higher than the individual mass of the nucleus okay so the effective mass of here we will take the effective ma mass of whole system so as our sample is in the crystalline form so here we will take the crystalline mass of whole system. So when we take the crystalline mass of whole system, it will make the ER practically, it slow down or minimize the recoil energy practically it becomes zero. Because we know that ER is inversely proportional to the mass. So when we use the effective mass, effective mass, is the mass of whole system okay is the mass of whole system then uh, it's mean that it slow it slow down the backward motion of the nucleus when mass is the greater uh, larger now it is the mass of whole system so it will reduce the backward motion of the nucleus so as a result it will minimize our uh, the recoil energy or practically recoil energy becomes equals to zero. So this uh, was first, this problem was first resolved by the Mosiber. So that's why it is known as the Mosiber fact. So next that how we can re record the Mosiber spectra using the Mosiber fact. 
how we can record the Mosbir spectra. So here I told you that the we choose the cobalt 57 as our source of a radioactive source. So when it captures the electron, it converts itself into the iron 57. So iron 57 is in the excited state. So it will get de-excited by the emission of gamma rays from excited state to ground state. So these gamma rays, let's suppose these are of 10 joule energy. And then there is the sample nuclei and it will absorb these gamma rays and so uh, this one is the ground state. it will go from ground state to the excited state so it needs an energy of 12 plus 2 joule so here it needs an energy of 2 joule extra it needs 2 joule extra energy to overcome recoil so how we can increase the energy of the source gamma rays to overcome this recoil energies. So how we can get the extra 2 joule of energy from, uh, from the source. So there are other methods by which we can increase the gamma rays, the gamma rays source. And so we can use the gamma rays of some higher energy because we know that we need the, uh, some extra energy to overcome the required energy. So how we can increase the energy of gamma rays in the case of a source of source nuclei. So there are the different methods and one of them is the here the most important is the Doppler effect. So here we use the Doppler effect to increase the energy of gamma rays. So how, how Doppler effect increase the energy of gamma rays source? So for the transition in the, uh, in the sample uh, source can be moved. So here we use the source, moving source. So we need to use the moving source. So whenever we move the source toward our sample, and so there will be the, or away from the sample, there will be the increase or decrease in the intensity of uh, energy in the, in the gamma rays, uh, in the source gamma rays, okay? So it's just like, example is just like we have the source of sound, this is the sound source and here we have an absorber. absorber. Okay. This one is the observer. When observer move towards the source of sound. So it can, we can listen the louder sound. The sound intensity increases when the observer move towards the sound. But when observer move away from the sound, of the sound, the sound intensity decreases. So just like this is called as the Doppler effect. This is the Doppler effect in the case of sound waves. So whenever we move the source towards or away from the observer, uh, then uh, observer from the source, then in that case, the intensity of the source increases or decreases. Now, how so we can use this Doppler effect in Mosbir spectroscopy? How we can use Doppler effect in Mosbir spectroscopy? Okay. 
So in most of the spectroscopy, let's suppose this is our source. This one is our source. And this one is the source of gamma rays. Okay. So gamma rays emitted from the source, emitting from the source, and then it are, these are going toward the sample. Okay. So these are going toward the sample, and the sample absorb these gamma rays, and it goes from excited ground state to the excited state. Then after sample, here we have a detector. So here is the detector. Detectors mean which detects the signals which is at the sample. So here is the detector. So when we move the source towards the sample and then its speed is taken as positive and when we move the source away from the sample then its speed is taken as negative. So here the source is the movable. So, so the source is the movable and sample is fixed sample is fixed mean that sample always remain at its place and source is the movable source it's either move toward the sample or it moves away from the sample so the speed of the source at which the transition occur is called as the chemical shape so here uh, when we move the source towards the sample it increase the intensity of the gamma rays. It will increase the intensity of the gamma rays. So there is a certain speed. There is a certain speed when we reached at that specific speed at which the transition occurs in the sample. And sample goes from ground state to the excited state. That specific point is known as the chemical shift it is known as chemical shift it can be represented by delta so here uh, we will draw uh, the speed of the source and intensity of the gamma so let this one is we, here we have the speed of the source of source and then we have energy of gamma rays and then we have intensity intensity okay and let's suppose when the source is at rest when it, then the speed is let's suppose zero meter per second and then energy of gamma rays is 10 joules and its intensity is 100%. And then its speed increases from 0 to 2 meter per second. Again, its energy is increases. As the speed increases, its energy of gamma rays increases 10.5 joules, but intensity remains 100%. When it reaches the 4 meter per second, Energy is 11 joules, but again, intensity remains the 100%. Okay, when let's suppose now we increase further, increase the speed of the source, and now it is 11.5 joules, and but still, intensity remains 100%. Now we again increase from 6 to 8 meter per second, and now its energy is the 12 joules. Now suddenly, Intensity decreases from 100 to 30 percent. Okay, but when we further increase the speed from 10, 8 to 10 meter per second, energy now in the camera rays increases from 12 to 12.5 joule, but intensity again remains the 100 percent. So this means that here the our critical speed is this one. This is the this one is equals to 8 meter per second. So here you can observe that at the speed of 8 
meter per second. The intensity of gamma rays decreases by 70%. So when its intensity decreases by 70%, it means that it is that critical speed. It is that critical speed which is called as the chemical shift. So this is the specific speed at which the inner, inner gamma rays absorbed by the sample and there is the transition from ground state to the excited state. So here we will get the sample, uh, we will uh, we will get the spectral of Mosbir effect or Mosbir spectroscopy. Here we will get the peak. So how we can draw this data? So let's suppose uh, this is the this one is the intensity along y-axis. So this is the intensity of gamma rays, and here along x-axis we draw the speed of source. So it's zero, two, four, six, eight, ten, and so on, and this zero. 2, 6, 4, 6, 8, and 10. And then this means that intensity remain constant to this point. But when we reach at the speed of 8 meter per second, so here this intensity drops suddenly 70% and then it becomes 100%. So the our recorded spectra of Mosbir spectroscopy will be like this one. Our sample will be will record the spectra like this one. So the Doppler shift in the frequency. So formula for the Doppler shift in frequency is equals to the change in frequency delta mu mu into v divided by c so here the delta mu represents mu represents the velocity this v is the velocity of the source this one is the velocity of source and c is the velocity of light The velocity of light and mu represents the frequency of the source. As the source is the movable, as it moves uh, towards the sample, as we increase the speeds, and then there is a change in the frequency or cross and uh, of the gamma rays, and so this is called as the Doppler shift. The Doppler shift in frequency. So now we go to the number of signal in the Mosbir spectra. That how many signal we can observe in the case of Mosbir spectra, and how, what are the factors on which the number of signal depends from? So the number of signal in the Mosbir effect. of signals in Mosbir effect. Mosbir effect. Okay, the number of uh, signals in the case of Mosbir effect depends on the environment, chemical environment of, uh, of the given compound or sample. So here it depends on the different factors. It depends on the number of ligands attached with the uh, with the samples like iron and tin. And let's suppose we have a complex like Fe2CO9. So here we have the iron. It means that there are the Again, which is attached is the CO. There are the nine carbon monoxide attached with this one. 
so it's, it will be bonding with like this one like this one so again it has Corpens are attached with this one. So these are again here we have iron and this iron is cross bonding to have three bonding with the three more carbons. So if you look at iron, iron, both irons are the chemically same because they are in the same environment. They will, it means that they have the same environment, the same chemical environment. So they will emit the one signal. They will emit only one signal. So let's suppose we have another compound. And now we have Fe3CO12. So in this case, let's suppose this one is the iron. Now the bonding will be like this one so this one is the carbon there is the carbon there is the carbon and again it has the bonding with carbon and again it has, there is the iron and then it is attached with the carbon this one is the carbon okay this one is the carbon and again it has the bonding with there is the third iron and this iron has the bonding with the carbon and this iron is like this one here is the carbon here is the carbon and the carbon on side so here you can look at the three these three irons this one iron this one and this one so here when you look at these iron this one iron and this one both these are in the same chemical environment because this iron this one is attached with four carbon other carbon and from one side and then these have the bond with the carbon monoxide carbon monoxide and then this one is attached with the this one iron and this one iron has also have the same chemical um, situation it's in the same chemical and so both the iron will give us the one signal and but when we come to this third one iron third iron is has the chemically different situation it is in the different chemical environment so one signal will come from this iron when the chemical environment is the same uh, when element in the, is the same environment then it will emit the one signal but environment is different then will be the different signal so this iron is in the different chemical environment so one signal will be from this iron and one signal will be from these both two ions so this combinedly this complex will give us the two signal so their two signals will come from this iron so because the this, these two are the the chemically same environment chemically same environment but the chemical environment of this iron is different so now we come to an other important term which we use in the Mosbir spectroscopy the isomer shift isomer shift so what is the isomer shift? Isomer shift, it is the change. It is, we can define it like, it is the change in the value of the frequency of the signal. In the value, value means that here the frequency of signals with respect to the standard okay with respect to some standard here we have the some standard or some references so the change in the value or frequency of the signal with respect to that standard it means that this shift can be seen in the case of 
grammar is spectral uh, uh, spectroscopy when we study the complex of two different nuclear isomers when we take the two different nuclear isomers and then we can see the isomer shift because the two are different both are in the different physical chemical and biological environment and we can see or observe the isomer shift we can observe the isomer shift when we study the complex of when we study the complex uh, study the different compound are complex to different nuclear isomer two different nuclear isomeric state okay. and both have the different isomeric states then definitely uh, it means that now they are in the different chemical or physical or biological environment so in that case we can observe the isomer shift so here the isomer shift is just like the chemical shift uh, it is the combined effect of we can say that the combined effect of the mosmer transition between two nuclear states mosmer transition between nuclear states two nuclear states and secondly there are the two transition between two atomic states transition between two atomic states okay so this Chemi this one is due to the chemical shift. Chemical shift and isomer shift are almost the same. The chemical shift, we know that it is observed when there is a combined effect of the Mosfet transition between the two nuclear states and transitions between the two atomic states. So, just like the chemical shift uh, in which you have, like, uh, you have the um, carbon and there is hydrogen there is the hydrogen there is the hydrogen here is the hydrogen here you can see that electron density is equally shared in all direction here it is shared equally shared in all direction but when we replace the one hydrogen by chlorine so when there is the we replace the chlorine with hydrogen now there is the difference in the electron density around the nucleus so uh, because now these chlorine and hydrogen has different electronegative values so different due to the difference in the more difference in the electronegativity means that now electron density will be the different around the hydrogen and chlorine nuclei so this is called as the chemical shift okay so same is the in the uh, same is the case with the isomer shift so here the electron density is different electron density will be different why it is different due to chlorine which has higher electronegativity which has higher electro negativity but here in this case uh, here the electron density is the same electron density is same in all direction okay so here the electron density is same so same is the case the isomer shift is also due to the difference in electron density around the nuclei. So this one is the case for this is for the chemical shift. And just like chemical shift, the 
isomer shift isomer shift is also due to difference in electron density around the nucleus around nucleus so when there is the different uh, electron density around the nucleus so it will shift the energy of emitted gamma rays which is called as the isomer shift and just like the chemical shift we also represent chemical gamma rays uh, isomer shift with the delta so now we go to the formula for the isomer shift so formula for isomer shift so isomer shift it is equals to it can be written as k into delta r divided by r into psi square s minus a now words are the this term and so here the k and k is the constant and c is also constant and delta r delta r is difference in the radius of excited state and ground state r is the radius of excited state and rg is the radius of this one is the radius of ground state okay and uh, what is the psi s psi s represents the density of s orbital okay this is the density of s orbital so now uh, we can find the isomer shift for the different isomeric states of the iron so let's we take again we take an example of iron 57 so iron 57 have iron as uh, simple iron then iron plus one iron plus two and then there is the iron plus three okay. so for this one uh, for iron we have uh, it has the electron configuration 4s2 3d6 for this one 4s1 3d6 4s0 3d6 and then 4s0 3d5 so here you can see that it affect the electron density of s orbital here the this we have the two electron in the s orbital then we have the one and there is the zero and again no then after s electron we have the d5 so here the decrease in the density of d orbital so here it affects the density is p p and d orbital influence the density of s orbital by screening so p and d orbitals screen the density of s orbital so first the electron during uh, the gamma ray transition so first the electron uh, when the different isomers are formed first there is the decrease in the density of s electrons so 4s2 4s1 4s0 and then after that we have 3d5 so p and d orbitals you know that it these screens the s orbitals here we have the s then we have the p and then d so d or d electrons are closer to the nucleus so first the electron captured from the s orbitals and then we go to the p and d orbitals so 
now uh, we can uh, rearrange these isomers and so there will be the isomer shifts will be the different in these cases so for iron 57 here are we are discussing the iron 57 for iron 57 delta r is negative so when delta r is negative so in that case the isomer shift is directly proportional to the density of s orbital so when the density of s orbital decreases then the, uh, it means that isomer shift increases. Isomer shift increases when psi s decreases. Okay. And when psi s increases, then isomer shift increases. So when we come to these isomers, here you can see that uh, the density of isomer shift of delta Fe. Here the density of S orbital is greater. It means that uh, it has lesser, less shift in the isomer sh and shift is less than 4S this delta Fe plus 1. And when we come to this one, here we have density of S orbital is greater than the density of s orbital of fe2 plus so it means that again we have uh, the isomer shift of fe plus one is less than the isomer shift of fe plus two but when we come here here the s orbital density is the same for both fe2 plus and fe3 plus but here the density of d orbital for fe2 plus is greater than fe3 5 but when d density of d orbital increases then there is it is directly proportional to isomer shift also increases but this one is inversely proportional to the s orbitals so when the density of s orbital decreases isomer shift increases but when density of d orbital increases the isomer shift increases so we can say that isomer shift is directly proportional to the density of d orbital but it is inversely proportional to the density of s orbital so here in this case the density of fe3 plus uh, of d orbital is less than the density of uh, d electron in the fe2 so it means that now in this case we have fe plus 2 is greater than fe 3 plus so now we can arrange them in the increasing order in increasing order we can write the shift uh, isomer shift of fe2 plus is greater than isomer shift of fe3 plus is greater than isomer shift of fe1 plus is greater than isomer shift of fe0 or this one so this one is an increasing order of isomer shift in the case of iron different isomeric state of iron Okay. Thanks for watching. For more videos, please subscribe our channel.